Hello, I'm Norman Gibbs. Where and when were you born? I was born in Waterloo, Iowa on November 12th, 1925. So how old are you right now? And I'm age 94 and thinking about my birth date, I'll be 95 just next month. What's that like? Uh, it's hell getting old, but <laughs> it's okay. I'm sure you hear quite often that you don't look like you're in your 90s. Well, my legs feel like it. And, and just tell me, sir, what branch of the service were you in? Okay, I was in the United States Army Air Corps, and uh, I was attached to the 15th Air Force flying out of Italy. I was with the 463rd Bomb Group and the 775th Squadron. That was perfect. What was your specific job in the plane? Okay, my job in the plane, uh, there's several little duties. First off, I was a right waist gunner. Uh, before we started the engines, it was my job to go up on the wings and check the fuel tanks, make sure they were full. And, uh, and then during flight, if anything happened to the flight engineer who was up in the cockpit, it was my job to go up there and take over for him. Of course, I didn't have all his knowledge that he'd gone through school for. So primarily it was just to take over his guns, which was the top turret. Uh, also, I was assigned a job to, in case of emergency, open the door on the back of the plane, or I'll say side, so we could all jump out. Uh, that's another little story, which we can go into a little bit later. Uh, what other jobs did I have there? I think that was about it. Other, otherwise, just trying to be a good crew member. And tell me, what, what kind of plane were you flying in? I was in flying in a B-17. Uh, after we finished our training, we were assigned a plane in Charleston, I think it was. I'm not sure what the state is, but it was a brand new B-17G that had heated cabins, closed windows, waste windows. And that was very nice. That was a great flight flying from uh, the United States over to Italy. Uh, it was a good trip. We got to see the Statue of Liberty flying not directly over it. They didn't permit that. But uh, we flew by it, practically around it, I'd say. Uh, we went up north into Newfoundland and then flew kind of southeast to the Azores, and then into Morocco, Algeria, and finally up into Italy, where we lost a nice brand new plane and they gave us one of the oldest they could find. <laughs> uh, of course, that's a natural train of events. Newcomers always get the old planes. Uh, well, when do you think you first arrived in Italy? I'm sorry, would you repeat? When do you think you first arrived in Italy? I would say we arrived in Italy about December, yeah, about the 1st of December. That's a little vague right now, but that's fairly close. Or 44. Yes, in 1944. And, and it was uh, winter there in Italy, 
but not a lot of snow, lots of water though. And uh, fortunately we had a tent that didn't have a bunch of holes in it so we could stay out of the rain. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't true all the while because there was a engineer in our tent from another uh, air crew and he saw a um, centipede going along the side of the tent. He shot it with his 45 with bird shot. Consequently, we had a tent that leaked after that. Um, there was one night close to Christmas where the engineer and I, you may want to cut this out, went over to the pilot's tent with a bottle of whiskey. We got him drunk. I wasn't a drinker at that time, so I was the only sober one, but uh, he wanted to come over to our tent, so we went outside and the engineer got on one side of him, I got on the other, and we practically carried him over there. But what uh, happened is that I didn't see this drainage ditch, and I stepped right in it, so guess who got all wet? The pilot who was drunk was dry. <laughs> um, we went on our first mission, which was a what they called a milk run to Regensburg, Germany. Uh, by the time we went over, the city had been destroyed, and we were just keeping them that way. So there was no fighters, German fighters, sent up to intercept us, and that's the reason they called them milk runners, easy, deal, easy to do. Uh, our second mission, again, we were in this old plane, and our mission was to Vienna, Austria. And uh, after we got into Yugoslavia, which was on a direct line between Foggia and Vienna, we lost an engine to overheating, and the pilot shut it down and feathered it going along and we were gradually losing our squadron. So the pilot being democratic, he said, shall we go on or shall we go back to base? And we were all green behind the ears and we all said, ah, let's go on. So we lost our squadron and we had a good navigator with us. But he took us right over to Vienna all by ourselves. Uh, we dropped our bombs and as we made our 180 to return to base, uh, I was sitting in the waist. This was another little job I had. I was chucking out chaff as fast as I could go. And for someone who doesn't know what the chaff is, it's like Christmas tree tinsel, which when it's thrown out of the plane and uh, hits the wind, scatters, and it just makes a big blob on the enemy radar. So the German anti-aircraft guns never did catch up with us. Uh, going back to our base, we lost another engine. Uh, well, the first one that went out was number four. That one was shut down and uh, prop was feathered. 
Going back, we lost engine number two. The pilot was able to shut it down, but the feathering system did not work. So that prop was windmilling, and the pilot ordered everybody in the nose of the plane out of there to go back into the waste. He was left there. Uh, the reason for that is that something has to break when a propeller is windmilling backwards. And if the propeller breaks off, which is what the pilot wanted it to do, if it goes off to the left, you're okay. If it goes to the right, it goes right through the pilot. That's the reason why everybody was chased out of the front end of the plane. Fortunately, the prop took off to the left. So now we're left flying on two engines. Well, when the navigator was ordered to go back to the waist, he just grabbed some maps off of his desk and went back and then found out he grabbed the wrong ones. So he lost track of where we were. And uh, we had, uh, what's the term for it? We had clouds underneath us. So we couldn't see the ground. We were still pretty high. And about that time, engine number one started to overheat. So the pilot knew he couldn't fly the plane on one engine. So he ordered us all to bail out. When the pilot rang the bailout horn or whatever you want to call it, it was my job to uh, open the waste door, jettison the door, so that we could bail out. But uh, when I went to do that, the cable, the steel cable, had rusted. So the cable came away in my hand and the door was still there. It just so happened I had a pair of dikes in my pocket. I don't know why I carried it, but I did. And um, I was able to pull the hinge, excuse me, I was able to pull the pins out of the hinge and push the door out. Uh, with that, seven of us jumped out, one right after the other. Uh, because I was wearing a chest pack, I was had been told to fall butt first in a V so that when I pulled the rip cord, which was right here, the parachute would pop open away from me. If I were falling out of my face, that parachute and the metal parts in it would be right in my face. Anyway, so if you ever have done a dumb thing. As I was falling before I pulled the ripcord, my helmet started to come off. So I reached up and pulled it down, but I didn't fasten it under my chin. It started coming off again. I reached up and pulled it up, down. Third time it came, started to come off, I just looked up and watched it go fly away from me. I don't know why you do dumb things like that, but I did it. Anyway, uh, we pulled rip cords before we hit the clouds. And uh, when I came out of the clouds, I was swinging back and forth. So you can control the parachute to stop the swinging. Uh, Anyway, I was enjoying the view. Forests, farmland, villages, and uh, all of a sudden I realized, my God, the trees were level with my eyes. So bam, I hit on frozen ground. Uh, that may have 
started some of the problems I have with my legs. And uh, so anyway, six of us got together. The seventh man, uh, somehow he got separated from us. Anyway, we, uh, it was late afternoon, so we looked for a place to hide and spend the night. Uh, we found a little wooded area that we could lay down in, and uh, those nylon parachutes are not blankets. They don't keep you warm. But anyway, we managed to survive the night. We got up in the morning and we started walking in line. But the last man, well, I should say it was foggy. The last man could see the leader curving off to the right. He couldn't follow a straight line. So anyway, we uh, stopped waited for the fog to lift, and we started walking through this forested area, and we came to a road. Well, the snow was about a foot deep and difficult walking through, so, hey, let's take the road. It'll at least get us someplace. So we did, and the road led us up to a like a block of forest and the road turned left and then it turned right to go around this block of forest. Well, when we turned right, boy, there's a platoon of soldiers coming towards us and they saw us. And when you have six or seven men just with 45s, facing a platoon of men with rifles, you give up. So anyway, we sat down by the side of the road. We took all the heroin out of our emergency packs and the extra ammunition for our 45s. We threw it all out in the snow. So we were armed with pistols, I had no bullets. Anyway, this platoon comes up. I'll say a platoon because it must have been about 40 men thereabouts. And uh, they wanted our guns. Okay. I happen to have mine in a shoulder holster. So I unzipped my jacket and reached in with two fingers took the gun out and handed it to this officer. <laughs> he turned that 45 around and looked at the muzzle. And then he took his gun out of his holster. I don't know what it was, but it looked like it was smaller than a 22. And his eyes just bugged out when he compared the size of his bullets or muzzle to the muzzle of the 45. Uh, it wasn't a comical situation, but it was. And I had to laugh. Anyway, they assigned about three guys to guard us, and they went on their way wherever they were going. And the three guards marched us again in the direction we were, had been going and we came to a village. Okay, they lined us up against a wood fence such as your six foot fences you put around your homes. One of them went into the village, the other two stood on the other side of the road where their rifles pointed at us. Well, we were wondering, is this a firing squad or what is it? Anyway, 
The other third guard came out of the village and motioned for us to come forward. We did. They took us into a farmhouse and lo and behold, they had a feast spread out. Uh, I should say this is in northern Yugoslavia, which is Croatian territory, which is under the control of the Germans. But anyway, they fed us very good with wine, pastries, sausages, And we thought to ourselves, is this being a prisoner of war? It was strange. Anywhere from there, they took us to another building, which happened to be a command post with a barracks attached. And they assigned us each to a, a, a um, bed, I guess. Okay. It's strange, we were still wondering what was happening. And one of our people who could speak German, understand it, he caught a few words. And it turned out that the Russians were about 15 miles away. And these people were going to hold us as hostages, hoping that we would say good words about them. All that lasted a couple of days. Then they loaded us into a farm truck loaded with frozen vegetables. They put Croatian great coats on us and Croatian hats to make us look like Croatian soldiers. So we got we start driving away. Uh, we came to a German checkpoint, and one of these Germans looked directly at me and said something. I had no idea what it was, so he said one more roust, one more word, which was roust, and made this sign. So we all got off the truck, and from that point on, we were under German control. Well, they took us into a prison. It was a nice prison compared to what we saw later. But they gave us a pot of soup. We didn't know whether we were supposed to eat it all right then or save some. Anyway, we had a good cot to sleep on. We were full of vegetable soup. And next day they lined us up, they had three guards assigned to us, German this time. And because I was the tallest one of the group, I guess, uh, the lead sergeant, or top man of the three assigned to guard us, had me carry his backpack. I thought, sure, he was had his wife in there, that thing was heavy. He had everything he owned in there. They took us to a railroad station. We got on a train. Uh, we had a compartment to ourselves, which was crowded with seven American prisoners and two guards. There was always one guard outside the door. Uh, the lead sergeant sat there and he opened his suitcase, a suitcase he had with him that was loaded with sausage and bread. He, he gave a certain amount to us, that's yours, you know. Then he gnawed away on the rest of it. <laughs> but uh, I have to say one thing for the German were Mark. They were like us. They were given orders. They followed their orders. In this case, one time the sliding door 
slammed open. A German officer stood there and he made the sign, Roust. That German squad leader or whatever he was simply raised his burp gun, aimed at that officer and said, Nein. The officer exited, slammed the door, and that's the last we saw of him. Uh, unfortunately, in a sense, the train stopped in Vienna. We had just bombed it a couple weeks ago. And the guards took us into a soup kitchen which had a lot of soldiers, civilians in there, and they had us get in line with the German people, or Austrian, I guess. Anyway, our um, one crew member who could understand German said, if I say you hit the deck, hit it. Well, just about then, the lights go out. He said, hit the deck, and we did. A few minutes later, the lights came back on. We were on the floor. Our three guards were around us where their guns pointed at outside. The guns were not pointed at us. They were given the job to escort us up into Germany alive. And they were doing their job. I have to compliment them on that. They never really gave us a problem during the entire trip. Anyway, we arrived up in Frankfurt, Germany, which was a interrogation point. We were marched into a prison and uh, each of us assigned to a single cell that had a cot, a small blanket, and an open window. Well, if I didn't mention it, we went down on January 15th. This was the coldest winter recorded there. It was the same weather the soldiers in the Battle of the Bulge experienced. Anyway, I was called into the interrogation room. The uh, German soldier started asking me questions in perfect English. He said he lived in Chicago for 20 years or so. And of course, we weren't supposed to give out anything. And uh, he finally says, well, it doesn't really matter. Here's your squadron identification. And then he really shook me up when he said, here's your grades from high school. I had just been out of high school for one year, but he had the records of my grades. That shook me up a little bit. Anyway, I was escorted out, and then they finally loaded us up into boxcars. Uh, if anyone has been over there, that I think they call them the 40 and 8, 40, either 40 men or 8 horses traveled in them. I think we had about 80 men in that car, standing room only, one bucket for you know what. What? <laughs> After about two to four hours, you have to evacuate something. And one bucket does not do it for about 80 men. So that was going all over the floor. Uh, we finally arrived at Wetzlar, Germany, where they had a, what do I want to say, a distribution camp. Uh, that was a good experience. We were assigned to a bunk, a couple blankets. Uh, we were given new clean uniforms. 
and uh, which the Americans had delivered to the Germans, just for that purpose, I guess. Uh, they had warm showers, they had a nice lunchroom, and they had uh, American GIs who put on, uh, what's the term, like vaudeville programs. Oh, being a prisoner of war isn't that bad. <laughs> Until they loaded us up in some more boxcars. Well, they took us to Nuremberg, Germany, and I was in a position where I could see out of the single window that was in that boxcar. And going through the city of Nuremberg, I don't think I saw anything standing higher than about 12 foot. The city was totally bombed out. Uh, they took us to a prison camp in Nuremberg and we were assigned to this one block and given a, a uh, bunk. Fortunately, I didn't have to share it with anybody but very few wood slats in it. So when you lay down in it, you make sure that the slats were in the right place to support you. And uh, once we got situated in the camp, they put us on the regular food line, uh, which in the morning was half of a soup can, if you picture a Campbell soup can of Erzat's coffee, which we swore was made from burnt charcoal. Uh, I don't think they actually had coffee, so it had to be something else. Uh, for lunch, uh, I, as I recall, we got half a can of soup, vegetable soup. And Occasionally there'd be a chunk of meat. You didn't know what it was, but you weren't worried about that at the time. But you look at the soup and there'd be a bug floating in it. So we'd pick out that bug and then when we'd chug a lug the soup and any bugs down below, not on the surface, we took in. That was our meat ration. <laughs> And uh, for dinner, we usually got a r rotten potato. And I can't recall, we shared a loaf of bread, eight of us. I can't recall if that was lunch or dinner. But whoever sliced it up into eight rations got the last slice. So you'd make sure that you cut everything equal. Otherwise, if you were cutting the loaf of bread up, you got the last slice, and if it was small, that was your tough luck. Um, after so much time, we got the word that we were going to have to leave, that the Russians were headed towards us. So we walked from Nuremberg to Moosburg, which was prison camp number seven, A, I think. Uh, at that time, I was a good walker. And so I wasn't bothered too much by the distance we were traveling, plus we had a German officer who I think was around 60 or so who obviously didn't, wouldn't care if the war ended. So he wasn't pushing us on our, our march from Nuremberg to Moosburg. 
But we did see British soldiers who were guarded by SS troops. We had to get off the road for them because they came marching through like they were going to a uh, party. <laughs> They were in formation, everybody was in step, and they really put the Americans to shame because we were sloppy. Uh, we finally reached uh, Mooseburg, which turned out to be one of the biggest camps they had. I was assigned to a barracks and I had to share a bunk with a Yugoslav soldier. Uh, but he was very welcome to me. Uh, I was a 19-year-old uh, youth, I'll put it that way. I never did have a big mustache or beard. But he got tired of seeing these long hairs popping out here and there. So he loaned me his razor. That was the first time I shaved. <laughs> uh, the first time you shaved was in a POW camp? Yes. Uh, fortunately, we got along well with the people in that uh, barracks. I did count seven nationalities in this one barracks. Uh, there was Egyptian, French, English, uh, Yugoslav, and I don't know what else. But it was an interesting time, although it was in prison. Uh, there was one day that all of a sudden, there's a lot of shouting outdoors. So I went outside, and lo and behold, there's an American tank sitting on the road. And the sergeant in charge of the tank was trying to keep POWs off the tank. They were climbing all over it. They were all around it, and uh, it just so happens that, what, now 50, 60 years later, I met that tank commander, and he's a very good friend of mine now. Uh, he said, the only thing you have to pay me for is to buy me a cup of coffee. So I did buy him a cup of coffee, which was in payment for his coming in and rescuing us. I should say that he had a total disregard for German property. He had his tank drive right through the prison gate, smash it down, and he says to this date the German government has never charged him for replacing that gate. Uh, he's a wonderful person and he's someone that uh, I'm really glad I know. Anyway, we were finally released from there. We had to march out to a big pasture where they had C-47s lined up. And we were signed to a C-47, we took off, and we flew to a camp they called Lucky Strike. And uh, there we were given hot showers, brand new clothing. It wouldn't allow us to keep anything. Everything went in a junk pile and we started out fresh. Uh, from there they took us to a harbor and we were loaded on a Liberty ship that had been converted by installing five tier bunks in the major hold. I think they 
held about 400 GIs there. There was also a group of officers. I have no idea where they were assigned. We only could see them as they were getting their steaks in the kitchen while we were getting soup. <laughs> they treated the officers very well and we were still in a prison, so to speak. Anyway, on the boat trip back from France to New York, we ran into uh, fog and icebergs. So something we found out is that when they were in fog in a formation like that, they ships would drag a telephone pole behind them, which would create a large wake, and then the ship following in the fog could see that and know where the ship in front of him was. Well, that was good for us. We managed it, and we found out later that the ship behind us was an ammunition ship. Ah, glad we didn't know it in the beginning. Uh, during that trip, uh, one ship did hit an iceberg and sink. I still have a newspaper article that uh, described that incident. Somehow somebody got the word back to our hometown about it and they printed it. Uh, we arrived in New York City, very nice reception, and uh, I can't remember the army base they took us to. Anyway, they processed us through, gave us train tickets, traveling money, and said, get out of here. So I went on a 60-day furlough. And I received my orders to report to Miami, Florida, to a certain hotel. But uh, so I went out and oh, during this time, I got married to my high school sweetheart. Uh, what was that like to see her for the first time? So oh, that was great. And it was great to see my parents and especially my dog. <laughs> At first, the dog would not allow me to get on the porch of the house. Uh, if you ever run up across a bulldog that's growling at you and giving you a bad look and poised to spring, <laughs> you don't move very far. Finally, the dog recognized me, and that was okay. But anyway, I went down and got tickets for my wife. I got married while I was home to go to Miami, Florida with me. And I got home, there's a telegram saying, report to San, San Antonio, Texas with no dependents. Nice honeymoon we had. Uh, we went, so I went to San Antonio, Texas, went back to the old GI barracks. Uh, they didn't have any work for us, so, so Every day there was a couple officers that would come in, say, everybody outside, we're going to dive bomb for cigarette butts. <laughs> By the time we got to the end of the block or area that we were cleaning up, there was only two officers and everybody else had scattered. We were ex-POWs, we couldn't care less what we were doing. and. Uh, they never gave us a bad time about it. And uh, from there, they shipped me to, I think it's Bowling Field in Kentucky. They knew I was going to be discharged in a couple months. They said, we don't want you. So they shipped me to Leavenworth, Kansas. And I was assigned to learn how to do the paperwork, 
for soldiers coming back from the Pacific. I did that for a week and then I got my discharge papers. So that's basically my story. I, uh, I appreciate you going through it. I want to go over some of the parts and ask you questions. Okay. So tell me about the first two missions you made. The first mission you mentioned, you know, was easy. Yeah, milk run. Did you guys encounter any enemy fire on that? Okay. On our first mission to Regensburg, Germany, uh, we flew in formation. I think we were at around 29,000 feet using oxygen. I think I was wearing every piece of clothing I could put on because, man, it was cold up there. Uh, that first mission, we saw some P-38s off in the distance. We were told they were P-38s. That was attracting the enemy gunfire. So they got all the ack ack and we didn't get any. Uh, so yeah, that was a very easy mission to learn about what we were there to do. Uh, the second mission, as I mentioned, we flew over the target ourselves, which is a very dumb thing to do. And, uh, but <laughs> I don't know if I mentioned it, one of my jobs was to chuck out the chaff, which was like tin foil for a Christmas tree. And the tail gunner told me later, he said the ack ack or German anti-aircraft fire, just followed us around our U-turn, never did catch up. I guess I was throwing it out extra fast. They didn't know where we were for, where we were for sure. Uh, <coughs> Explain for those who don't know, what would chaff do? Okay, the reason we threw out the chaff is that that would deflect the German radar. And if there was enough chaff out there, radar could not pinpoint where we were. And so either because it couldn't pinpoint where we were because I was throwing it out so fast, or they didn't figure it was worth it to shoot at us, just a single plane. I prefer to think it's the chaff that did it. <laughs> the, because the radar was, their anti-aircraft gun, their anti-aircraft guns were controlled by the radar. Yeah. Um, could you see on your second mission the bombs hitting the target? No, I couldn't uh, see what the bombs did because I was in the waste and all I could do is see out the side to the other well, there weren't any planes next to us. But all I could see was like looking out a window in a house. It's framed and that's all you see. Uh, the tail gunner, the ball turret gunner, they had an ideal position to see what happened. Uh, quite truthfully, because we didn't have a bombardier, we didn't know what the actual target was. So when we dropped our bombs, we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> and we were flying about 29,000 feet. At that distance, you really can't make out the details as to what the bombs hit. Uh, 29,000 feet, it's like you're looking at a road map from 10 feet away. You really can't make out the details. Um, hmm. Tell me about 
that feeling you had before your first combat mission. You know, you'd arrived in Italy. I mean, what was that like right before you flew that first mission, sir? Okay, when we arrived in Italy, uh, this was in December. So the weather was lousy. It rained a lot. Uh, we got a little snow at that location. But evidently, there was that area from Italy up into Europe that got a lot of bad weather, snow, rain, ice, whatever. And so we couldn't go on missions. Um, I guess the most tragic thing I ever saw was one night they let us go into the city of Foggia. And uh, coming back, we hitched a ride on an ambulance. So there's eight or ten of us on the ambulance. I happened to be in the right-hand front seat. Uh, we're driving along this road, no lights. And uh, we came to this railroad track. There was a guy standing next to the tracks with a hooded lantern. We couldn't even, it was just barely make him out. And for some reason, the ambulance driver put the brakes on and the engine died. Well, he couldn't start the engine again. And being on the right-hand seat, I happened to look out to my right, and all I could see was this hooded headlight on this train engine coming towards us. So I hollered train, and boy, that right-hand door flew open fast, and I got the hell out of there. Uh, the guys in the back, they opened the back doors of the ambulance, and they started piling out. But one guy didn't get out fast enough. The train hit the front of the ambulance, and the back door caught that fellow and threw him under the train. It sliced off the top of his head. I happened to be the only guy with a flashlight, and I found him. That was not a sight I would like to remember. That was my own experience at seeing someone killed during the war. Um, they finally took us into the squadron doctor. He asked if we were all right, and I said, yeah. My tail gunner is with me. He says, well, let me give you a shot of whiskey. That'll help you. <laughs> I wasn't a drinker. I was too young and whatever, but I gave mine to the tail gunner. Boy, he put both of them down real quick. Uh, that was my own, only really bad experience during the war. I, I appreciate you sharing that. Could you clarify, why were you in the ambulance again? Okay, coming fr back from the city of Foggia on a one night furlough, uh, we hitchhiked. And regretfully, we got a ride in an ambulance where the driver was having trouble keeping the engine running. And uh, he stopped right on some railroad tracks and the engine died. He could not restart it. That's when I saw the train coming. And, but you mentioned earlier in the story that you thought it was someone holding a lantern? Yeah, I guess there was a, what they call a switch man or something there, or because it was a road. They had this guy positioned there, but he was just standing there with a lantern. He didn't tell you guys to 
move or anything? Well, he couldn't. I think we were too far away for him. Well, he just didn't shout anything. He just held up the lantern, uh, gas lantern, not electric. So it didn't really hit us like an electric lantern would with a beam of light. How far were you from the ambulance when the train hit it? I was far enough from the ambulance, from the rear of it, that uh, those swinging doors on the back probably just missed me because I had to run all the way back there. Um, I don't know how close it was. I never gave that a thought. I mean, well, that must have been a tremendous noise when the train hit the Oh, well, yeah. The ambulance was right on the tracks? The engine of the ambulance was on the tracks. So when the train hit it, well, let's say this is the engine of the car, of the ambulance. When the train hit it like this, it just threw the ambulance, ambulance around to the side. The rear doors were open. This guy was trying to come out, and that rear door caught him and just threw him under the train. Uh, that was the worst experience I had during the whole war, seeing that happen. And you didn't know that man, though? No. No. Had no idea who he was, but it just bothers you anyway when you see something like that happen. I wonder how they would classify that, you know? Is it just an accidental death, you know, because you have friendly fire, or you have the enemy, you know, killed in action, or? Just accidental death, yeah. It makes you wonder how many of these happened across during the war. During the war, I would imagine there was a lot of accidental deaths. Get this, I was researching the planes and the Air Corps, something like 20,000 men throughout the whole war, just the U.S., were killed in training accidents. Yes. That's just the Air Corps. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. 20,000 just in training. Never even got a chance to fight the enemy. Well, when you consider that the bom heavy bombers of that day usually had 10 crewmen. So if one bomber was shot down or had problems and went down, there's 10 men gone. So on a, those missions flying out of England predominantly, if they lost 10 airplanes, that's 100 men. And uh, that's why there were so many Air Force men in prison camps.